Right, how are you? My name is Tony Medina, and um, I'm here to speak to you guys about my experience with um, suspected CTE and uh, recent PTSD diagnosis. Um, so, who am I? I'm a father of three girls. Uh, my oldest daughter is right here, Gabby. She's a sophomore of San Diego State. And uh, I'm 42 years old. I have the best girlfriend in the world here, Vanessa. She's my, my rock, my support system, my strength, my world energy. Uh, I'm battling suspected CTE. I put the suspected in quotes because this is a disease where the doctors can't tell you you have it or you don't. And so all they can tell you is, we suspect you have this. Um, and that's pretty frustrating as, as a patient. You know, I've been through every test you can imagine. Uh, I've had two lumbar punctures, MRIs, CAT scans, EEG, EMG. I mean, you name it, if there's a test for it, it's probably been done. And they all come back normal. Uh, but we know that I'm not normal. You know, I'm not, I'm not who I was just a few years ago. And uh, there's a correlation here with the stories that were told prior. Uh, and we were we were laughing when we were listening to this. And again, to just bring humor to a really crappy situation. Uh, but getting lost going home. You know, that happened to me. I showed up at the wrong house and uh, got out of my car and thought I was at home and nope. I was two doors down. Um, driving around, you know, you, you ask yourself, why, why am I on this road and where am I headed? And that happened to me too frequently. Um, it started just kind of happening a little by little, and then it just kind of all came on and, and it was happening more often than not. Then you throw in the short term memory loss. Uh, and that, you know, that compounds on me. But uh, I'm gonna digress a lot. I'm gonna tell you guys that right now. I'm not a, I'm not a slight leader, so these are just there to prompt me because my memory sucks, and um, I, I forgot I have this whole other half. Uh, so my story is I played high school football. Uh, I, I, I mentioned that because this disease seems to be real popular with people when you say. Have you heard of CT? And they go, oh, the football injury, or oh, the movie concussion. And uh, yeah, that's all true. But I'm here to tell you, I think, suspectedly, um, that you don't need to play high school, or you don't need to play in the NFL, or in the NCT way, um, to be affected by CTE and, you know, brain injury. Um, a lot of people want to, want to Think that you, you had to have had X number of documented concussions or this many head injuries or a certain reason, you know, and, it, and the truth is all it is is repetitive blows to the head. It doesn't matter how you got it. it you could have been an NFL player, could have been like me, uh, where I played, I played 91 through 95. Uh, I never left the field, guys. I was I was on the field, offense, defense, and special teams. Didn't come off the field, um, and that's a lot of a lot of head blows. I played position as a tight end, so I was an offensive lineman and a receiver. Um, and every play, you're either blocking or you're, you're going out and you're going to get tackled. So those add up. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, don't always assume that. You had to be in the NFL, or you had to be in some high-level contact sport. The only word that matters there is contact sport. It doesn't matter what level. If you're just jarring your brain around, you're going to get a good most of it. Um, at least that's what the science is moving that way. Um, oh, one more thing. That's just that's um, I also sustained some head injuries. I'm a retired police officer, firefighter, EMT. I worked for the city of Sunnyvale and uh, the public safety officers, so we're policemen, we're firemen, we're EMTs, all in one control car. 
or uh, or Viagra. Um, when you do that, you also get injured. You get head wounds. You're fighting a fire. Stuff coming down on you. Um, you're on the streets, and you, you you may get whacked in the head a couple times. It's, it's part of the business, you know. Um, and uh, and so through that, and and through all of this, um, and and talking, you know, with the doctors, and I'm a social worker now. Crazy, um, but in talking with her and, and Vanessa and everybody, we kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, yeah, there's there's a CTE stuff that we suspect, but there's a big component tied into your past work history. Um, and that's where the PTSD talk came in. And um, and then eventually led into a diagnosis um, of PTSD. And that's just from years of working the streets, um, seeing the unimaginable and, and, and being there and dealing with it, having to fix it, having to be the one to take chaos and make something out of it that's going to be a good outcome for as many people as possible. Um, you do that enough times, and I guess it starts to eat away at you and you can count it with the other stuff that I have going on. and. Uh, and it, it, it affects you, you know? So, real quick, this is my reason for living right here. Um, Vanessa, and my little monkey, Sophia, they have me right here, and then Leilani, my comedian. Um, all these guys are, are you know, they, they were talking suicide. Um, suicide's a real, a real thing. Um, I mean, obviously you guys know that, but when you're in this position, it's not something that you, Focus on, um, but it's 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 a thought, and it's 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 something that you know is a possibility. Um, so much so that I got rid of my gun because uh, I don't want to have that ease of access. Um, you know, and again, this disease is so new that nobody can really tell you when you're going to get that suicidal feeling or how sick you need to appear to get that suicidal feeling. There's no real progression of benchmarks. Um, I just, I didn't want to take that risk. So I got rid of my gun and, uh, and that's that. Uh, I can't forget my dog. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's my buddy. Uh, seriously, he's, he spends more time with me than anybody. I don't leave the house. And so, uh, just like, I, he was saying over there, you don't leave the house either. Yeah, I, I don't leave unless I'm with Vanessa on the weekends. Monday through Friday, it's me and Paul laying in bed and, uh, or hanging out. I mean, it, it's just, like these guys were saying, it, it's hard to explain when you're not going through it. Um, and I know, you know, I was on that side, arresting people that were often kind of like these guys had described earlier. Um, and I'm not innocent either. I've been kicked out of my own speech therapy and I've been kicked out of therapy. I have no pride in saying that, but this thing makes you get a little, a little upset sometimes, a little aggressive. Um, and so, unfortunately, you know, we, we get asked to leave some places. And that's all right, because we're here. And, <laughs> All right, so let me tell you how this all began. These are myself. Back in 2004, my lower left lip went numb. Uh, at that time, I had an MRI, and they saw two little spots in my brain, so don't worry about it. So I didn't worry about it. Stayed numb, still numb. Uh, fast forward to February 2018, and I started feeling just like I'm in a constant fog. It's, it's, it's hard to explain, but from the minute you open your eyes until the minute you go to sleep, it's like you're walking around in a bubble. And, um, and you're just in a, in a, in a fog. Uh, confusion always happens. You just, just get confused. Uh, my short-term memory loss. And it's not like, I mean, there, there's times where I'll be speaking and I need to ask, like, what was I talking about? Because I forget. Um, and, and that's that's how quick. Like, I'll just be in the middle of something, and 
it just takes something to take my mind off that train of thought, and it's not. Uh, but, you know, I forget to eat. Or I'll forget if I use the rest. Uh, and the, the list goes on and on. And I, I forget more things than I remember now. Uh, I have numbness in my, like, right here, my face, all this is numb, my legs, uh, and, and my toes. My bank account. I drank it twice, shopping online, and not remembering that I bought all kinds of stuff, so I bought the same stuff twice. Um, and it was stuff that I didn't really need, but this, this is the stuff that this disease does to um, They say, you know, that causes impulsive behavior. Well, I can attest to that. I had a bunch of Amazon boxes that were cool. Um, and then by May 2018, I stopped driving just because I lost my home. Um, couldn't remember where I was. I never told you guys that. Also, though, is um, what, what adds to that is when you are driving in this state, it's just overwhelming. There's, there's you know, you have to focus on the cars, and it sounds so ridiculous, but it's true. Like, focusing on cars, lights, when people are transitioning, moving lane speed, it's just too much for my brain right now, and, and I don't know why or how you know to fix it. But my remedy was just stop driving because I a didn't want to kill somebody, didn't want to kill myself, and I'm sick of getting lost. Um, sure, views we talk about that. It's it's unfortunate, um, I think, in the sense that I get a little pissed off, but I haven't gotten to that point where it's been rage. Um, and, and that's something that if you watch the movie Concussion, you know, you see the, the guy's raging and mad at his family. And I can't say it's not coming, um, but I can say that, thank God right now, I'm totally able to, to just know when I'm upset. She knows. And, uh, and then we just deal with it. But it doesn't get, it doesn't get um, out of control. Uh, um, no interest in being in crowds in a lot of places. I used to love um, going to concerts, big events, uh, street fairs, I mean, wherever. Even when I was a cop, you know, there was some big event, I signed up to work overtime um, for that event. Now, like I said, I don't leave the house. Um, and it's just because, well, A, driving, I can't leave. Um, but B, it, it, it's just not a comfortable feeling. Um, leaving the house and, and really not knowing if you're going to find your way back. You know, I go on walks with my dog sometimes and uh, and in the middle of the walk, you know, it's like I have to kind of just look around and try to familiarize myself with my own neighborhood. And uh, and that's that's just part of part of what's going on. Um, the, this, this is one that's really hard to explain, but I'm going to try my best. I have a strain in my brain when I try to compute things. And some doctors call it uh, migraine, some call it headaches. I went to the migraine specialist and they said, tell all your doctors you're not having headaches, because I'm not. What happens is when I, when I speak my own thoughts, I have no problem just talking, honestly. Um, but when you ask me a question and I need to figure something out, I get these two sensations in my head, and I, I can pinpoint about an inch down and about two inches in, on each side about half an inch long, and it hurts, and then I get nauseated. And it's just a weird sensation that I can't describe. I see people nodding their heads, so I like that, because um, that means some other people understand. But it's, it, it's the worst feeling, guys, like just when you're trying to figure out simple math or when you go see a neuropsych and they put these blocks in front of you and they tell you to, to organize them, like that just makes me instantly nauseous and I get this icky feeling in my head. Um, stutters with S's and F's, uh, and then clumsy. I, I, am, I used to be, like, I mean, I, I, was, I was on the SWAT team, I rode a motorcycle, um, and of course, like, I, I did a, a ton of stuff. Now, I can't even shake a salad without the thing opening on me nine times out of 10. Like, it's just stupid to have a burn on here. Just weird things that where I'm not 
able to A, feel the burn um, like I used to, to get it away, but B, just do little, um, find my, my, my fine motor skills are decreasing. So, so what's been done? This is me being a low bar puncher, um, but it was very, it was very really fun. But I was putting on 200 milligrams of total max daily. That, to me, was uh, a sentence to hell. I became just a, a, an asshole. That's the best way to put it, you guys. I yelled at a poor girl at a, where were we? Ike's. Because they didn't have gluten-free bread. And I let her have it. That's not me. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she was the, we haven't been back. <laughs> uh, it's, it's one of those things where I was not me. And that medicine um, was, was just a nightmare. I mean, look, it got me kicked out of the medical foundation I was at because this guy who prescribed it to me didn't recognize what it was doing to me. And then I, I, made, I made some complaints, and they ended up doing an investigation on the complaints I made about the doctor. But somehow, out of all of that, I got let go from the medical foundation. So it's, uh, it still boggles my mind today. But I, I don't care. I've moved on. Um, so here's all the stuff I already told you guys about that. Then I have my neuropsych test. I don't know if you guys have been through a neuropsych or know what the neuropsych is. Um, I don't think that the woman who administered it to me was truly the one to administer it for me. Um, because at well, at the end of her her neuropsych eval and then you know a few days later she gets all the scores, she tells me, uh, yeah. Memory worse than an advanced dementia patient, but science hasn't caught up to you, and I don't have a diagnosis. Wow. And yeah, so and then she wrote somewhere, which now my doctor at Stanford um, is questioning, because she wrote somewhere that I was easily able to figure out the harder little puzzle things, and I had difficulty with the easy ones. And my reasoning for that, which I think is totally logical, but I don't know, Dr. Sear, maybe you can tell me, is um, that I spent a good 10 to 15 minutes on these easy blocks. And then after I was finally able to figure it out, she would give me one or two more blocks and say, you know, add on to it. I just spent 15 minutes figuring out the first part, and then you threw it in two blocks. It's simple. So I, I don't know, maybe. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just seems that somebody would be able to figure out that they watch you struggle for 10, 15 minutes and then see you do something easily that, I don't, I don't know how neuroscience have done, but I'm just telling you, that's what I had done and now it's a conclusion that science hasn't caught up to me. Which is probably true when we're talking CTE because science hasn't caught up to anybody with CTE, you know, until post-mortem. So there really is nobody living today that science has caught up with when it comes to CTE. And we're, we're all fighting a good fight. We're all here trying to, trying to get an answer. Um, and I appreciate you guys being here. And thank you all for being here for that, uh, because it's really important. So again, see my specialist at Stanford. Um, so the first time I saw her, she told me, I think you have CT. I mean, convinced. I think you have CT. And, uh, and I was like, all right. So we left there thinking, okay, we're going to deal with this and let's see what, what it brings. Um, next time, she told me that based on my neuropsych test, she doesn't think it's CTE because people with CT shouldn't be able to figure out the harder puzzle pieces. To, to do this. But whatever. So in October of 2019, I get my retest um, for my neuroscience. So it's like, sit around and wait, and, uh, and in the meantime, there's nothing we can do for you. 
but come on back and we'll test you again. And then if that test says what I want it to say or what I, what I think it should say for this, then we'll start some kind of treatment plan. But until then, there's really nothing that, that they do for it. Uh, and right here, it says, you know, it's common for a lot of CT patients. They all just don't know much about the disease. And a lot of them, uh, honestly, unless they're a specialist, they seem very hesitant to want to dive into or even have a conversation about that because they're afraid of what they don't know. And, and until they admit that and, and really just embrace it, because guess what? Nobody knows. So nobody's expecting these neurologists to know, but it's almost like they want to protect that lack of knowledge and not just talk about it. I can't tell you how many neurologists I've tried to speak about it and they all say, oh, you gotta go talk to the memory clinic. You gotta go talk to them over there. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's something that, I know it's not just me, uh, it's very common for a lot of patients of brain injury CTE. And so I just want you guys to, to hear me, but know that I'm speaking for thousands of other people um, that have the same story. So now here it is. <laughs> My story is too common. The reason I have this guy here behind the red bubble rope <coughs> is because it seems like CT is like some prestigious club that you gotta earn your way into. Um, and I, and I, I mean it when I say that, because when you talk to these to your neurologist, we talk to um, you know your speech therapist, or even I'm going to physical therapy guys for my shoulder, and my physical therapist is trying to tell me about CTE and how it's uh, you know she she's again trying to keep me out of the club. Um, you know she tells me that because in her life she had an experience where she was stressed um, and it made her have short-term memory. It's gotta be what's happening to me. And that's what these, these um, teams of, of providers seem to, seem to want to either want to fall back on something that's familiar to them, that they've experienced or that they've treated and worked with, or they just want to dismiss it. Um, and unfortunately, that's just because there's a lack of knowledge out there, um, and it's going to be coming and improving and getting better, and, and it's going to, you know, there, there is going to be hope for, for people like me. Um, but for right now, you know, doctors do all they can to, to deny your reality. Um, I can't remember who said it. One of you guys said it, but uh, but you were talking about how they tell you, you know, oh, you're fine, or, or you know, you know, you go, go away, uh, or something along those lines. I don't remember exactly what it was said, but I can tell you that's the truth, you know. Um, you, my, the, the neurologist that was giving me the lumbar puncture, I told him I was forgetting things, and then I told him the things I was forgetting, and his response to me with a, with a, a smirk and a laugh was, huh, you wouldn't be able to remember what you're forgetting. And my response was, no, asshole. This is brand new to me. And this is major. So yeah, I'm going to remember. You know, because I don't need you telling me what I'm not remembering and what I am. Because you're not in my brain. And to think that somebody's not going to remember forgetting their home or where they were driving is asinine. They're going to remember those events. Maybe not your home, but you remember that you forgot your home. You know? Um, again, the doctors don't know enough to be excluding anyone yet. They don't. They're, they're, if they can't tell you you have it or you don't have it. They can't kick you out of the club or keep you from the club. And it's not a club that anybody wants to be a part of, but they really are trying to keep you out. Um, and then this is what I tell you is, you know, if, if you're telling me it's not CTE, then Give me an alternative because I don't care what you call it. You call it CTE, Alzheimer's, dementia, whatever you want to call it. I just want to know what road I'm headed down and how we're going to treat it and what to do. I don't mean to say I'm a patient of X, Y, or Z because you can't, that doesn't change what's happening to me on a daily basis. 
So I've been affected by this. Um, and this isn't just my story. This is uh, every patient that's going through this. Financially, it's been a disaster. I mean, I used to be able to work and make a good living. Now, I, I just I can't work because I can't drive. I can't remember simple tasks. You know, when I was working, towards the end there when I was getting sick, um, I was forgetting conversations I had with people that were important. I was forgetting um, phone calls that I made. I was forgetting meetings. And so, I, it's just financially, it, it's, it, it's tough. Um, yeah, the, the, so here's, okay, uh, the emotional part. This is a huge part. You get frustrated beyond belief. And when you look like me, healthy and well, appear to be healthy, um, you kind of get prejudged because these people at these uh, the, the clinics, especially clinics, I go to Stanford. So at the, at the memory disorder clinic there, you rarely are, are seeing somebody like me. I mean, people are in wheelchairs, people are older, people are very, very progressed into their, into their illness, into their sickness. And so what this, what this does for me is it makes me wonder, like, how bad do I have to get before somebody's gonna pay attention? Because I'm watching myself spin and spin and lose more and more of me, but nobody wants to address it. The doctors just want to, they, and, and I, I, I can't say they don't want to address it, but you can't. You know, all they can do is send you a speech therapy, or occupation therapy. Um, at least that's the only thing that's been offered to me. You know, and some, some Balta for, uh, for, for depression. Um, <coughs> And then here, this this is what I really want you guys to see. This disease is way bigger than the NFL, NHL, or any other professional sport. It's affecting our youth, our soldiers, victims of domestic violence, and countless others. It's my belief that my belief that many of our homeless have CTE or may have been passed off as a druggie, or they went crazy, or they were misdiagnosed. Now, why do I say that? Because a lot of people that are homeless are from, you know, uh, so the majority came from lower income families or along the way they, they, something happened. My guess is that if you were to go into the history of a lot of these people, you're probably gonna find some contact sports, some military service, and some brain injury mixed in. But, unfortunately for them, they got sick at a time where CT didn't exist, and the research didn't exist, so you were bipolar, you were manic, you were a drug, you were an alcoholic. Um, and you're given all these names, none of which apply to you, uh, because really you have a brain in you, and there's something going on physically. Uh, so. So here I have to think, since so the doctors continue to ignore those of us with all of the classic symptoms, which I have that in quotes because again, you can't put any classic symptom on this. It's, it's, it's a work in progress. But there's people with enough symptoms that match the rest of the population that is suspected of this, where hopefully more and more people will be able to get into studies and tests. Uh, which I know is coming. Uh, oh, one more thing here. This is very important. Your friends and family, they disappear. Uh, and, and that's not something that's uh, fun to say or even a fun life to live, but it's real, guys. I, I can't tell you the number of phone calls I've gotten and text messages. Let's go to lunch. How you doing? Let's go fishing. Let's do whatever. Guess how many of those people have shown up? Zero. Okay? Zero. And that's not just my story. And I don't blame anybody um, because I'm not the center of anybody's book. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but as far as my friends go, you know, they have their own families to, to get to, and, uh, and I understand, but my, my, my message to you guys is, don't offer. If you're not gonna follow through, just don't even offer, because it's a lot better for me to not be wondering when somebody's gonna call or when we're going fishing, when we're gonna do lunch. It's seeing them check in on Facebook around my neighborhood, um, and then still be sitting at home with Posey. You know, it's, it's no fun, go ahead. And I'm wrapping up, right? This is one thing I want you guys to, to read, or to, to listen to. This is, I, I belong to several Facebook pages um, for CTE patients, brain survivors, and yeah, brain injury survivors. This is from a woman that, she just put this on just a few days ago, and I was like, oh, you gotta have this. So it's Benton. So I had an EEG to try and make these seeds, and I went into an episode from the strobe lights they use. But the notes on the results are totally confusing me, and they say they're normal, which concerns me. I've been basically just left to suffer with these insane neurological problems for over a decade now. Aside from an I'm 99% certain you have CTE type diagnosis with the it's going to get worse from here prognosis, it definitely came true, but zero treatment options were given to me. And I just don't want to be dismissed all over again. I can't keep living this way. I literally can't leave my bedroom anymore. I'm so debilitated by how bad it's gotten, and I feel like I'm dying. I won't know more until a couple of weeks from now, and I hate the way that I mentioned it's been 10 plus years to get to this stage. So I keep trying to comprehend WTF, the test is talking about, and doing research. Everything I read about episodes like this don't show up on EEG is confusing, conflicting, and littered with an all in your head lingo and casual recommendations for therapists. Which annoys me to no end. Sorry, seriously, but tell me I need a therapy to fix it. I need therapy to fix this. I'm going to say F you. I have no patience for gaslighting no matter who, who does it. If it comes to that, they should be honest and say, we don't know what's wrong. We don't have any treatment options. And instead of just conveniently throwing me under a mental illness bus, here's hoping they play that card. Well, anyway, this needs to be That is what it's like, you guys. It, it, I mean, that story, it wasn't mine but I can relate to every word in there. And that's how so many patients uh, with brain injuries and suspected CTE feel. So, uh, I just want you guys to, to really keep that in, in, in consideration, especially you doctor out there. Uh, so what's next for me? I'm seeing my neurologist at Stanford, uh, seeing my, my uh, memory loss specialist. You can only treat the symptoms as they come. Uh, because there's nothing you can do to slow it down or stop. I'm starting a nonprofit, toniswish.org, and I have a blog, uh, tonysblog.org. If you guys want to check out any of those, I would really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you again. Yep, that's it. So thank you guys so much. Thank you.